Welcome to First United Methodist Church, Starkville. We're proud that you have joined us. We are a large community of faith, and we serve God together here in this community, and we invite you to be a part of our worship today. Welcome to the morning service of First United Methodist Church of Starkville, the church in the heart of the town with Christ in the heart of the church. Our weekly Sunday services are at 8.30 and 11 a.m., and our evening service is at 6 p.m. Join us now as we come together and exalt Jesus Christ, our Lord. and welcome to worship at Starkville First United Methodist Church. It is so good to see each of you here today on this first Sunday of the new year. We hope that you'll experience Christ's presence as we worship him together this morning. There are several, uh, please take a moment and sign the pew pads located at the end of each pew and pass those down. There are several announcements that I'd like to bring you to your attention. First of all, young people, if you are 22 to 34, we will be beginning a new Sunday school class just for you. Next Sunday be, will be at, uh, in the chapel immediately below the sanctuary here. Also, this Wednesday night and this week, the spiritual formation classes crank back up. We have a number of new studies being offered. There is a Beth Moore study on Monday and Wednesday, a K. Arthur study of Hebrews on Monday nights, and the Wednesday Bible studies resume at 10.45, or excuse me, at 10 and 5.45 p.m. A special treat, Greg Ducker will also have a study of Galatians that will begin on January the 13th that will take the place of the class offered by Jim Orman. Also, children's Wednesday night activities will resume this week. The Gap Choir and Quest beginning at 5.30 and Preschool Choir at 5.45 p.m. Please note that both the contemporary and the evening services begin, will resume next Sunday. And also, the next senior adult lunch will be Tuesday, January the 12th at 11.30 a.m. As you know, six children and three adults lost their lives on Monday the 28th in Starkville. According to the Red Cross, it will cost over $30,000 to lay these families to rest. In response to that, the church is going to be taking donations. If you would like to make a donation, please mark your check with either funeral expenses or fire victims, and the church will send a check to the Red Cross to help with that situation. Now please stand and join in the call to worship that is printed in your bulletin. <clears throat> We are gathered in the presence of the God who chose us before we chose him. We are gathered like the people of Israel, summoned by the God who called us and makes us his own. By our presence here, we are claiming our place in God's family. Let us pray together. Almighty God, we come now seeking to worship you with our whole hearts. Come and be in our midst and help us to do just that. Help us to lay aside the cares and the concerns of the week that is past and the year that is past and look forward in anticipation of that that you have for us in the time that is to come. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Tell me the stories of Jesus, number 277 in your hymnal. Let us sing together all stanzas, please.
remain standing and join together in the historic confession of our Christian faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. hearts together and go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty, holy, loving, and just God, all praise, glory, and honor belong to you and you alone. You have shown yourself in great and wondrous works throughout the course of history, and we celebrate your greatest activity the Incarnation, in this season of the year. You have shown yourself to be trustworthy in becoming like one of us, even though we have not always returned the favor. In the year that has passed, we have experienced numerous joys, new lives born into our midst, new relationships, strengthened friendships, and your presence among us. But we have also experienced the pain of human suffering, the passing of loved ones, relationships that have been weakened or broken altogether. Many have lost their jobs, and some see no hope for the future. God, help us. Help us to be a part of your ongoing activity as we enter a new year. Help us to minister to those who are suffering. Help us to be comforters to those who are experiencing loss. Help us to be reconcilers and healers of relationships. God, help us to recognize the hope that is always present in you. Come, Holy Spirit, and move in our midst. Open our hearts and minds to your word. We need to be filled with the fire of your presence that we might truly be lights in a very dark world. Father, we thank you for the love that you have shown us in your Son, Jesus Christ, who was willing to become vulnerable for our sake, who submitted himself to die on our behalf, who rose again and lives forevermore. And now we pray together the, the prayer that he taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now it is time for our children to come forward for Moments with Miss Jane. Children, please come forward. <laughs> Put that as a nativity scene. I'll put that as a nativity scene. Okay. Let's walk over and put these people back at the nativity scene. Those are all the all the people we have to put on there. Let's walk, gather around the nativity scene over here. Let's 
go over this way. Come on. These are some people that we haven't added to our nativity scene yet this morning, have we? You know, we've been doing that all leading up to Christmas. Who are these people that we're adding today and these animals? Um. Who is this in the Christmas story? What? That's right. These are the wise men. Let's see. Let's try to them. We'll add the wise men today. We don't know exactly when the wise men came. The people who study the Bible think that maybe the wise men didn't come and for a few months because they came from, from a long way away. And so it may have been a few months or even a couple years before the wise men actually got there. But we know that they got there and they found Jesus. And we always include them in our nativity scene because it's important that we remember that they followed the star that led them and they found Jesus. Um, here's the story of the wise men. You probably already know it, but um, the Bible tells us that in the days that Herod was king after Jesus was born, some wise men, who probably were men who studied the stars, um, came to Jerusalem and they started asking, where's the one who was born king of the Jews? Well, that got King Herod's attention because he was pretty worried. He thought, oh no, is there another king? Is someone going to take over my kingdom? So he started asking the religious leaders of the time um, about the prophecy, the king of the Jews, where he would be born. And the religious leader said, well, he'll be born in Bethlehem. So Herod called the wise men to him secretly. And he said, um, when did you first see the star in the sky to know how to come find the, find the king of the Jews? And the wise men, I guess they told him. And then Herod said, well, when you find him, come back here and tell me where he is so I can go worship him. But do you think Herod really wanted to go worship Jesus? No, he didn't. He didn't. But the wise men left, and the Bible tells us that the star continued on ahead of them, and it came to stop over the house where Mary and baby Jesus were. And the wise men went in. They were so happy to find him. They said they rejoiced with great, great joy. They bowed down and they worshiped Jesus and gave him their gifts that they brought of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And then the Bible goes on to tell us that they were warned in a dream from God not to go back and tell Herod where Jesus was. So they went home another way. And that's the end of the Christmas story, the end of our story that we learn about Jesus' birth. But it's not the end of the story of Jesus, is it? Jesus went on to teach people and heal people and save people, not just the people back then, but us today too. I want to read you something that his disciple John said. I like this. John said this right at the end of the book he wrote. There are many other things Jesus did. Listen to this. If every one of the things Jesus did were written down, I suppose the whole world would not be big enough for all the books that would be written. We just can't imagine what all Jesus did when he was here, can we? So the story of Jesus just began when Jesus was born. It's a never-ending story, and it never ends. The story of Jesus never ends because Jesus is alive today, and he's alive tomorrow, and Jesus lives forever. And because of that, his love for us goes on forever. So the story of Jesus and his love for you never ends. And I hope you remember that this year at the start of a new year. All year long and always, Jesus will love you and be with you. Will you pray with me? Thank you, God, for your son Jesus, for this never-ending story of love that you give to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Our offertory hymn this morning, think... Alas, and Did My Savior Bleed, is numbered 294 in your hymnal. Let us sing together all stanzas, and let us stand, please, to sing.
Let us pray. Almighty God, we come before you and acknowledge that all that we have and all that we are comes from you. Lord, we give back now these tithes and our offerings for your glory, for the advancement of your kingdom. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Scripture reading this morning is found from the book of Isaiah, chapter 60, verses 1 through 6. Isaiah 60, verses 1 through 6. Listen for the word of the Lord. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the people's. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look around. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from far away, and your daughters shall be carried on their nurses' arms. 
Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and rejoice because the abundance of the sea shall be brought to you. The wealth of the nation shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you, the young camels of Midian and Ephah. All those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense and shall proclaim the praise of the Lord. Truly, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, choir, a song with a, a beautiful message, and uh, thank you, lady, is on the piano as well. Well, we have uh, crossed over into the year 2010 or 2010, however you decide to say it, and we've never been here before, never before, and I wonder, what did you bring with you? What did you leave behind? For you see, what you bring with you and what you choose to leave behind may very well determine the new year for you. There's a story in ancient Greek mythology that says that one day at the end of her life, a woman went down to the river Styx to be uh, ferried across to the region of departed spirits. And Sharon, the, the kind ferryman, told her that it was her privilege to drink from the water and the river. And he said that the water would make her forget, forget the life that she was leaving behind. Well, this sounded very good to this woman. And she said, good, I will forget how I suffered and Sharon said, that's true. But remember too, you will also forget how you have rejoiced in this life. And the woman said, and I will forget all of my failures. And the old fairman added, yes, and, and also you will forget your victories as well. 
And the woman continued, and, and I will forget how I have been hated. And Sharon added, yes, and also you will forget how you have been loved. And with those words, the woman paused for a while to consider the whole matter. And finally, she decided not to drink the water at all. She preferred to keep the memories even of sorrow and failure rather than to give up her memories of love and joy for a lifetime. What did you bring with you? What did you leave behind? I love the coming of the new year. I, I love the coming of the new year with all of its possibilities. And, and, and maybe it's because that, that I have this, this picture imprinted in my mind, a picture that I saw in the first newspaper of the new year when I was only a boy. It depicts an old man, very worn and frazzled, as he comes to the end of the old year. And he's passing the banner of the new year onto a very young child, still in diapers. And to me, that, that picture represents renewal and hope and promise and possibility. And my friend, we all need those things, don't we? We all need that. Now, I, I must confess to you that in recent weeks, I felt a lot like that old, worn, and frazzled man who is still pictured in my mind. And I've told folks that I've been singing Merle Haggard's song, you know, the one that says, if I make it through December, everything's going to be all right, I know. If we make it through December, we'll be fine, I know. Well, I made it. I made it. And from the looks of things, you did too. You did too. And, and here we are this morning in this sanctuary on this first Sunday of a new year. And so far, think of this, so far we have perfect attendance in worship for the year 2010. Think about that. So, in, in fact, let's keep it up. Let, let's keep it up. In fact, let's covenant together to meet here and worship our Lord every Sunday morning in this new year. My friends, we've been blessed with a new year. Blessed with a new year, a new year with great hope, a new year with great possibility. For many Christian churches, this is also the beginning of Epiphany, that season of the church year that begins with the wise men following that distant light, a star, until it finally came to rest over where Jesus was at the time. Don't you remember? Don't you remember how light was at the center of our Christmas celebration just a couple of weeks ago now? Don't, don't you remember that? It, it really was. Light was in the, in the middle of our celebration. We strung lights on our Christmas trees, some that blinked on and off, on and off. And each Sunday here in the church, we lit Advent candles, one and then two and then three and then four. And even we even uh, put lights in the tree outside so that uh, we could raise money for our Wesley Foundation. On Christmas Eve, don't you remember we, we dimmed our sanctuary lights and, and we lit candles to celebrate the birth of our Lord, the fact that, that Jesus Christ, God's only Son, was now living in our midst. The wise men came following a light, the brightest light in the sky. So don't forget the light. Don't forget the light. And the symbol of light is so appropriate as we begin this new year. Think about it. Light is a dominant symbol throughout the Bible. In, in the very first chapter of the book of Genesis, we, we learn that God made the light. That's where it came from. God made light. And God saw that the light was good and separated the light from the darkness. And Jesus, in his teaching, 
encouraged his followers by saying, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. And then he said about our witness, about our testimony that we do not light a candle and put it under a basket. We don't light it and put it under a basket. We are to let our light shine through our good work so that others can see God. Light is important. Light is important to this Christian faith of ours. In our scripture today, when Isaiah wanted to proclaim the, the future, the coming of the Messiah, the one that everyone had looked for, the anointed one of God, he declared, arise, shine, for your light has come. Arise, shine, for your light has come. This is great news as we begin the new year. Great news for us as we begin the new year. Our light has come. Christ is our light. And in him there is no darkness at all. <clears throat> as we begin this new year, uh, we can know that the light of Christ shines into our lives. It, it shines into our puzzled minds. Have you thought about that? That, that the light of Jesus Christ shines into our puzzled mind. Let's face it, we, we begin this new year with uncertainty. How will we fare this year? How will our health be this year? What about the economy? Will it be better or will it be worse? Will our loved ones act the way we think our loved ones should act this year? What about that constant battle that we have with terrorist and feeling secure and safe? Or, or maybe even more locally, what about those who mourn the nine who died in that tragic apartment fire this past week? Just three or, or four weeks ago, our church helped a young mother and her three children, and they died in that fire. They died in that fire. We helped some. We helped some, but now they're dead. And now there are funeral bills to pay. Life is so uncertain. Life is so uncertain. And, and what about the church? What about our church? How will it function this year? How will we serve God in 2010 at First United Methodist Church start for? Will we do better than we did in 2009? Or will our concern for the economy cripple us this year? Will small negative seeds germinate and grow in our midst until like the weeds in, in Jesus' parable, they strangle out the ministry that you and I share together here in this church. There, there's just so much that we don't know. There's so much that we don't know. It's enough to boggle our minds. It, it certainly puzzles our mind. Life can be such a mystery. There are lots and lots of uncertainties for sure. Of course, there's lots and lots of people who tell us that they have it all figured out. They try to tell us that in so many ways that, that they have it all figured out. Charlie Brown, the, the character in, in the Peanuts comic strip, thought that he had it all figured out too. Lucy said to him, life is a mystery, Charlie Brown. Do you know the answer? And good old Charlie Brown quickly answered, be kind, don't smoke, be prompt, smile a lot. Eat sensibly, avoid cavities, mark your ballot carefully, avoid too much sun, send overseas packages early, love all creatures above and below, ensure your belongings, and try to keep the ball low. And, but before he could say another word, Lucy interrupted him and saying, hold real still because I'm going to hit you a very sharp blow upon the nose. Well, today, I can appreciate Lucy's frustration. Can't you? Can't you appreciate that? Some people, though, have convinced themselves that they have all the answers, and they would like to convince us that as well. 
But no one has all the answers. No one has all the answers, no matter what they try to tell you, no matter what they try to tell us, no one has all the answers. Instead, we need to acknowledge, as, as, as Paul does in the book of Ephesians, life is a mystery. Life is a mystery, but, but in the midst of that mystery, in the midst of the darkness, there's a light shining. It's the light of Jesus Christ. And we need to claim that. We need to make that a part of our daily living, the light of Jesus Christ, the light of one who came to live among us. Once there was a judge in Yugoslavia who, well, I think you could say had a very bad day. He was standing in the bathtub and happened to reach up to turn on a light. And he received a, a tremendous shock of electricity and fell out of the tub. And his wife called the doctor and the doctor came and pronounced the man dead. So according to governmental health regulations, the man's body was placed in a vault beneath the, the cemetery chapel. And, and then hours later, in an open casket, the judge regained consciousness. And at first he had no idea where he was or what had happened to him, and he climbed out of the casket, but the vault door was closed, so he shook the door and he cried out for help, and the guard was outside and was terrified and the guard ran away, but he did return later with some help and they opened the door. So the judge phoned his wife and said that he was coming home. <laughs> she screamed and hung up the phone and then she fainted. And next he tried to go into several homes of, of his neighbors, but, but they had heard that he was dead, so they slammed the door in his face. They thought he was a ghost. And, and finally he had a friend, found a friend, who had not yet heard that he was dead. And he convinced his friend that he really was alive. And so this man acted as a go-between and gradually convinced the judge's family and friends that he really was alive. Now, most of us, most of us would not have much trouble convincing folks that we're alive. But the truth is, some of us would have trouble convincing folks that our lives have any meaning. I think that's the catch. Some of us would have trouble convincing folks that our lives have any meaning at all. Our faith in Jesus Christ, my friends, the way we attempt to live our lives as Jesus lived his life is our statement to this world of ours that yes, my life does have meaning. My life is important, it has meaning. We, we may see through a glass darkly as, as Paul did once, but there's a divine purpose to it all. There's a divine purpose to it all, and, and that divine purpose is, is somehow wrapped up in that, that mysterious man from Nazareth, Jesus. Jesus is the light for our puzzled minds. Christ is also the light for our troubled hearts, for our troubled hearts. Sadly, lots of people around us have troubled hearts. They do. That's the way they're beginning this new year, my friends, with troubled hearts. And, and some of them are people that we might never even imagine are troubled. One day, an emotionally disturbed man went to see a psychiatrist, and he confessed that he was frustrated, that he was depressed, and that he was actually desperate. And, and the psychiatrist probed very deeply and, and things just didn't look good at all. And, and then the psychiatrist, after talking with him a while, remembered that there was a circus in town. So he recommended that the troubled man go down to, to see the circus clown. He said, he'll make you laugh. He'll make you feel better. But the disturbed man blooded out, blooded out, but doctor, I am the clown. I am the clown. Even a clown can know what it is to have a troubled heart. Have you ever thought about that? Some of our funniest people have troubled hearts. 
some of the folks around us who laugh the most and maybe cause us to laugh the most just might have troubled hearts. I, I think of, of people like James Varney, the hilarious guy who made all those, those uh, funny Ernest P. Worrell movies like uh, Ernest Saves Christmas and Ernest Goes to Jail and, and movies like that. And, and I think also of Don Knotts who played Barney, the blundering deputy on the Andy Griffith show. They're good examples of, of funny people with very troubled hearts. Funny people who, who make us laugh and yet they have difficulty in, in their own lives as well. Just the other day I was flipping through the channels on TV and, and they were showing to my amazement a, a colorized version of that classic movie, The Wizard of Oz. And in that movie, a young Judy Garland sang a song which touched the hearts of, of millions of people. The song, Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Somewhere Over the Rainbow. That song expresses a, a longing to escape to some faraway place where problems melt like lemon drops. Wouldn't that be good? It, it, it tells of a distant place where bluebirds fly over the rainbow and, and then it asks, why, oh, why can't I? Why, oh, why can't I? Sadly, even with her professional triumphs, Judy Garland battled personal problems throughout her entire life. She was insecure about her appearance. She thought that she was unattractive and overweight, and, and so she used drugs to control her weight and to increase her productivity, and then she struggled with the resulting drug addiction, and then she was plagued by, by financial problems and back taxes, and four marriages failed, and she attempted suicide on several occasions, and finally, she died of a drug overdose at the age of 47. Now, did Judy Garland ever find what the heart yearns for, for rest and for spiritual satisfaction? Probably not, probably not. There are times when all of us know what it is to dream of happiness somewhere else, somewhere over the rainbow, because sometimes our own lives are filled with darkness and despair. And oh, how we all need to see a light shining in the darkness. How we all need to see a light shining in the darkness. Dr. David Siemens, a, a longtime uh, pastor of Wilmore United Methodist Church near the campus of Asbury Theological Seminary, wrote about Mike, a, a very troubled young man who came to see him one day with a problem. And Mike's father was well-meaning and sincere but he was also a very harsh disciplinarian and he would often punish Mike by shutting him up in the barn and, and then taking a strap and whipping him severely. And, and then he would let Mike go only after ordering him to say, tell me you're sorry, tell me you're sorry. And the father would repeat this over and over again until finally the hysterical little boy would, would say that he was sorry and, and then the father would force him, force Mike to hug him and kiss him. And David Siemens in writing said that through prayer and counseling, Mike was able to relive and, and to be delivered from those painful experiences that were still alive in his subconscious mind and soul. Dr. Siemens called this the healing of memories, the healing of memories. Have you ever had memories that needed to be healed? Have you ever felt like life has beat you down and forced you to do things that you would have rather not done? Well, as we begin this new year, perhaps there are some of us who need that kind of healing, the healing of our memories, the healing of our memories. My friends, Christ can do that for us. He's the light for our puzzled mind. He is light for our troubled souls. He's light also for our defeated spirits. For our defeated spirits. If we're not careful during times of uncertainty, we can allow our spirits to become defeated. 
And, and then comes the feeling that we're not worth very much at all and even that we're a failure, that we're a total failure here in life. Now some of us can remember far enough back to remember quarterback Bart Starr. During the 1965 football season, uh, when he was playing with the Green Bay Packers, Bart Starr had a little incentive scheme going with his oldest son. For every perfect paper that Bart Jr. brought home from school, Bart Sr. would give him 10 cents. Well, after one particular rough game in which Bart Starr Sr. didn't feel like he had played his position very well at all, he went home weary and battered and he went into his bedroom to finally get some rest and just some peace and quiet and there he found a note attached to his pillow. It was from his son, Bart Jr. It read, Dear Dad, I thought you played a great game today. Love, Bart. And also, taped to that note were two dimes. We all need a little encouragement from time to time, don't we? I challenge you to remember to do just that this year in the spirit of Jesus Christ. Lift people up this year. Don't tear people down. Lift people up higher. Don't push them down lower. Everyone needs encouragement from time to time, so take the time to give it to them. Maybe this past year has been a little rough for you. Perhaps you need someone to put their hand on your shoulder and encourage you to reinforce your feelings about yourself, your good feelings about yourself. Christ seeks to offer that encouragement to each one of us. And I, I hope, my friends, that this church does that for each one of us too, that, that we'll build each other up, that we will encourage one another in this new year. Arise, shine, your light has come. That's what Isaiah says to us today, my friends. Arise, shine, your light has come. And I say to you, don't forget the light of Christmas. Don't forget the light. Don't forget what we just celebrated, the very presence of God who came to live among us. What better hope can we find for a new year than that? What, what better hope can we find than that? There was once a, a very poor widow sitting at home behind locked doors and, pro, and pulled curtains and she was wringing her hands waiting to be evicted from her home. She was way behind in her rent and she knew that. Her other bills had accumulated as well Already her utilities had been turned off and she had received a notice of eviction, but there was nowhere else for her to go. So she sat in darkness in the dark and cold house waiting to be evicted. And then there was a knock on the door, but she didn't answer it. Instead, she sat inside in absolute silence not making a sound. And, and then she heard the knock on the door again and, and she trembled at that sound, but finally the knocking ceased and she gained a sense of relief and she assumed that it was the officials who had come to repossess her property and to put her out on the street. However, however, if she had only mustered enough courage to answer the door that day, she would have found to her delight a totally different situation. The, the person knocking on her door was her pastor. Through the grace of her church and this woman's friends, her pastor had raised enough money to pay her utilities, to pay her rent, and even pay all of her other bills. Her pastor had come to share the good news and offer her the relief that she so badly needed. My friends, there is a friend knocking on the door of your life today. There is a light shining in any darkness that you might have. It is shining for you, so arise, shine. Your light has come. Whatever you do in this new year, whatever you face 
in this new year, when you're puzzled and you don't know which way you're going to turn, when you're troubled and you don't have any idea what to do next, when you've done all that you know to do and your spirit is totally and completely defeated, don't forget the light. Don't forget the light. It's the light of Christmas. It's the light of Jesus Christ who came to live among us as the Son of God. It's the light that will show us the way in this new year. Don't forget the light. My friends, as we think about uh, a new year, I challenge you, do as God leads you to do. On the first Sunday of this new year, this is a great day to start all over, to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. On this first Sunday of a new year, it's a great time to, to transfer your membership to this congregation, to be a part of the ministry that we share together. On this Sunday of a new year, it's a good day to do what God leads you to do. Would you not do that as we stand and sing together hymn number 297, Beneath the Cross of Jesus. <clears throat> My friends, it's uh, my privilege to uh, uh, welcome on your behalf uh, three folks into our congregation, John King and his uh, wife, Vanessa. And uh, they transfer from uh, uh, Wyoming United Methodist Church. Uh, first time I've heard of that. And uh, you know, that's kind of like Mississippi United Methodist Church, I suppose. <laughs> and uh, he works uh, out at uh, university in the athletic department. And uh, we're so pleased to have them. They've been a part of our congregation for a few months now. And, and I know that uh, you'll take this opportunity to greet them and welcome them to our congregation. And now, my friends, hear the words of Jesus who said, You don't light a candle and put it under a basket. You let your light shine. Jesus is the light of the world. Go and let your light shine in the name of Jesus.